This is an introduction to uh, numerical hydrodynamics. I don't know actually how familiar you are already with hydrodynamics. It would of course be very helpful if you knew something already, but I will give a very brief introduction to that as well. Okay, the outline of the talk is, as you can see, first some basic introduction into the field, then I will talk about different discretization procedures, and then some theory in between, uh, then I will add or have added a chapter on diffusion, because I think it's very important in astrophysics and worthwhile to be discussed. I will give you some examples, uh, partly from my group, partly from other people, how they uh, worked on, on hydrodynamics and some, show some videos, how they work, and then I will give you some literature in the end. I have a little project uh, prepared for you, which is available on the web page that you can see in the public chat, which has been added there today. And there you can click uh, on that uh, link and you will see the lectures as I show them, show it today. And you can as well see a link to a project which asks you to solve a, uh, let's say, linear advection problem by yourself uh, and in one dimension and it's called Project P1. It says preliminary on the web page, but it's, I think, the final version. Um, and we can go through this, and I can even maybe give some assistance, or uh, Sari has apparently also worked on it already, so she knows how to do this. And otherwise, I can try to give some assistance if you like. Okay, I will start now, if there's no comments initially, with the basic lecture, okay? Uh, we start from the hydrodynamic equations, as I've written them down here in um, these first three equations here. They are the continuity equation, equation number one, where the three-dimensional density rho is evolved in time. Through this equation here, you have the partial time derivative plus the divergence of rho times u, where rho times u is the so-called mass flux, okay? So you always have the same structure in these equations. On the left-hand side, you always have a time derivative or time derivatives here, plus the divergence of some fluxes. And it's clear for the continuity equation, it's the mass flux. For the momentum equation, it, it's, it is the momentum flux and for the energy equation, the number three, it's the energy flux, which is written here. And since it all contains the velocity u here, these are advective flux. That means fluxes of the uh, properties that are transported, or properties are transported with the fluid flow, okay? Good, so that's the left-hand side. So as I pointed out, momentum equation number two, energy equation number three, where epsilon is the specific internal energy. That means energy per unit mass. Okay, that is specific. Uh, the phrase here, and rho times epsilon, for example, is then the energy density. So we have here mass density, momentum density, rho times u, and energy density, rho times epsilon. So this is the same structure on the left-hand side in all three equations. On the right-hand side, we have these so-called source terms uh, that modify the conservative properties on the left-hand side. And we can see that for the mass, of course, the right-hand side is zero, since mass, as we know it, is 100% uh, conserved. There cannot be any mass created in the universe. We hope so, or we think so, at least. Then we have here uh, the gradient of pressure. As you know from your daily life, it's pressure gradients that drive the weather. And um, if, the we if the gradients were disappearing, there would be no winds and no gas flows. So pressure gradients are driving the motions on the left-hand side. That's the source term. Plus, as I've denoted it here, rho times k, where k are 
the external forces, and this is in principle uh, the accelerations. Since it's specific forces also here, a K, and this is force uh, uh, um, per unit mass, and this is the acceleration here. So that's the source tensor. This would be, for example, a gravitational field if we had some, if you work you know, on, on the Earth or in astrophysics, of course, working in the field of a central star or something. Okay, the energy equation also has a source term. Uh, as, we, as we have seen, this was the thermal energy. Epsilon is the thermal energy or internal or thermal energy here. So it does not contain the kinetic energy. And the internal energy, as you know from your thermodynamics uh, experience, is can be changed by pressure work. So we have here P times the divergence of U. And it's clear the divergence of U describes the compression or decompression of the gas. And if you compress the gas, you make it uh, denser. That means diff U is negative. So the right-hand side would then be positive and you would increase the internal energy. So you can see that this describes compression of the gas. And you know this from daily experience that compression heats the gas up. So we have these source terms on the right hand side. Okay, and uh, these are written in 3D. So we have vector quantities here on, on the velocity here. And by the way, this cross here is the so-called dyadic product, um, which makes this whole expression here u cross u as being a tensor or a matrix in this sense and the divergence of this matrix makes of this expression a vector again this is just a special compact notation if you want to know more about it you can look it up in the standard hydrodynamics books so this is also a vector divergence of a matrix is a vector in this sense also okay so these are the basic hydrodynamic equations we need to close the system here uh, by an equation of state. Yes, we have here row, the variables are rho, u, and epsilon. These are five variables. P would be the sixth variable. And so we have a relation between uh, P and rho times epsilon given by this expression here. And this is the so-called ideal equation of state. Okay, for an ideal gas, essentially. And we know also already here that um, uh, on the um, this interesting note here, too much time on the computer. Um, and you can see here that epsilon is directly for uh, an, an ideal gas uh, proportional to the temperature. It's CV times T, actually. Okay, so we have a relation. P is a function of rho and epsilon, or P is a function of rho times or at T, and we can close the system of equations. And we are all done. So the, the goal of numerical hydrodynamics is to solve equations one, two, three, plus equation four on, with the numerical methods. Because the problem that you can see here already is that these systems, you can see it clearly at equation two, is highly nonlinear. Okay, so you have here the first time derivative of u, and here you have terms quadratic in u, so you can see already that this is highly nonlinear, and as such, it's very difficult to obtain analytical solutions to the hydrodynamic equations. Only in very special cases, actually, we know analytic solutions for the hydrodynamic equations. And that's why already very early people have begun in solving these equations numerically. Okay. So we can combine now here this equation number four plus equation number three. And you can see here, we have your rho epsilon here, and we can replace this rho epsilon here in this equation here and obtain an equation for the pressure, which is sometimes very useful, okay? So we can, expl can express here uh, this ex equation here and replace it by um, this equation here. I just was wondering whether everything is okay, but you can figure it out. Okay, so you have only the pressure as a variable here, and you could also solve for this. Okay, this was the introduction to hydrodynamics. So you can now, I will rewrite the equation now in a different way. Uh, if you compare the equations now, we have changed the left-hand side, okay? So we have changed here. You can take apart the divergence 
first you can apply it onto the density as the gradient, then you apply it on the U as div U, and also here you take all these products here apart, and then you can rewrite the left-hand side in this form here, okay? So here we have the time derivative of the uh, density of the velocity directly and the pressure here, okay? Here we have the classic U nabla operator here, which you know from, from letter dynamics, maybe applied on the same quantities here. And on the right-hand side, you have again some source terms. And this here, for the momentum, it's, it's the same essentially, but for the density and energy, they look a little bit different here. And in this formulation, you can see there appears some sort of um, source term for the density, but which is not, of course, meant that you can create mass or not. You have just the left-hand side is just not written in this so-called conservative form, okay? To repeat, conservative form means you have always d over dt plus divergence of the flux. Good. So we have all functions depending here on, on, on r and t, as you can see. Here, rho is a function of r and t, and all the variables. This one, for example, u is a function of r and t and, and, and the energy pressure and so on, okay? And then we can see that on the left-hand side here, this quantity, d over dt here, go to equation 10, d over dt plus u nabla can be written as capital D over dt, that's how I denoted it here, it's the total time derivative, which you call, in fact, in hydrodynamics, material derivative, okay, which is, a, a, as a Rotian principle, equivalent to the total time derivative, because you have variables that depend on T, so you take the partial derivative here, and since R is a function of T also, because you are in this total derivative, you know from classical mechanics, you are in principle moving with a particle and look how the properties change of the fluid while you're moving with the particle here. And this is the so-called Lagrangian formulation here, okay? There's two formulations of the hydrodynamic equations, the Eulerian uh, formulation and the Lagrangian formulation. This one here would be the Eulerian uh, um, uh, formulation here. You are fixed in space and time and look at that position, how the fluid properties change. In the Lagrangian formulation, you are sitting on a fluid element, moving with the fluid and see how the fluid properties change on its way. These are the two different equivalent but equivalent formulations. I will come to this in a moment. So you can rewrite it either into this total time derivative form or in the partial derivative form. If you do it in the total time derivative form, so to speak, then it, the equations resemble very much the Newtonian equations, as you will see in the next slide, I think. So we plug in on the left-hand side, we just plug in this total time, the material time derivative here. And you can see, for example, looking at the second equation 12 here, you can see that the time derivative of the velocity, the acceleration of the fluid, is just given by the forces on the right-hand side. So this is what you expect from classical mechanics, okay? So this is a very intuitive formulation of the equations here. And uh, there is also two ways, I may uh, say this here already, two ways of solving the hydro equations. Either you go come from this Lagrange formulation here, then you do it by your particles, for example. I will say a few words about this, the so-called smoothed particle hydrodynamics approach uses this Lagrange formulation where you sit on the particles and, and follow the fluid then. Or you have the Eulerian formulation where you have a grid which is fixed in space and time, for example, and the, and the fluid flows through the grid. So these are two alternative formulations theoretically and also two alternative formulations numerically. Okay, this is uh, very important to keep in mind. So here, as I said, you're sitting on the fluid follow the time variation of the fluid variables while moving with it, okay? All right, I think everything which is written here I have said, okay? Um, I would say something more about the Lagrange formulation. 
uh, the advantages and disadvantages, and then I will uh, concentrate in the latter part of the talk on the Eulerian formulation here. Okay. If I will just continue there, I hope you, it's not too easy. This was the basics of um, the first part of the talk has been covered. And uh, if you have any questions, you may just state them now, uh, either in the chat or by raising your hand and, and make yourself known if you have any questions concerning the hydrodynamic equations if themselves, as I have no idea how familiar you are with this. By the way, this is a... Uh, uh, some some figure I, I, I thought about some some eye catcher here on, on, the, on these uh, chapter outlines here, and I just took uh, this uh, this book here. I don't know whether how accessible it is for you guys. If you look very carefully on the internet, you will definitely find a PDF version somewhere. Uh, but I think it gives a very nice introduction into the field. It's more a classic introduction there, where there's not the latest hydrogen, uh, let's say, numerical features there, but it's a very solid. I think, introduction in the field by well-known, I have to say, well-known astrophysicists. Okay, then we go to the discretization here. This uh, uh, famous Japanese painting may be familiar to you. You have, it's called the Great Wave, I think, here, which is coming up here on the left, and, and some person, I don't know whom, I got it from the internet somewhere. <laughs> this plot here, you can see, the goal is to come here from the continuum description of the hydrodynamics to a finite, let's say, discrete description of the process, because that's what you need to do numerically. So we have a continuum, continuum on the left here, which you slowly discretize here, and then you have the discrete version here on the right-hand side. So that's the goal in performing numerical hydrodynamics. The Continuum goes into a discrete version. You solve the discrete version, and this hopefully mimics real life as close as possible. That's the game you would like to play here successfully. Okay, so we'll see now how you can do this. As I've said, there's two different ways of approaching this problem. First, you have, let's say, um, fixed let's say methods, grid-based methods with a fixed grid, which we would call a Larian, as I've shown you. The, the fluid is flowing through the grid, okay? So imagine the word Euler, which was undisturbed initially, and after you wait some time, a certain fluid disturbs it in this way here, as it's given here uh, on the left picture here. So the fluid disturbs the letters as it flows through the grid. Okay, matter flows through the grid, as I've said here, through this equation here, which I quoted here. There's different methods in approaching this. Um, first of all, you can directly take the fluid equations and discretize them by your known methods. That means you would do some Taylor expansion of the quantities on, on these uh, grids, on the spatial grid and, and let's say time grid here and then you would arrive at, at finite, finite difference equations, they would not then necessarily be conservative. That means the equations, the, the discretized numerical equations would not conserve, for example, mass. Okay, this is the standard. If you just take this equation, for example, as it's written here, and straightforwardly discretize it, you would not be conserving any quantity. Okay. This is in general non-conservative. You can go and look at certain, let's say, boxes here where you monitor the flux of material across the boundaries of these boxes. Then you would have a conservative scheme, which can look very similar to the finite difference scheme, but nevertheless, you keep the conservative property of the equations here. This is called a finite volume control volume scheme. And the Riemann solver scheme is based on the control volume scheme and allows you to keep the wave properties of the fluid equations. You know that uh, the standard hydrodynamic equations give rise to phenomena like sound waves, uh, and these sound waves need, of course, to be modeled properly and capture these the, the, their properties, and this can be done with modern Riemann-based solvers. I will not go 
into details with this here. Maybe in some later talks, you will hear something about it. The problem always in numerical hydrodynamics are the discontinuities. I will tell you how they come about and what you can do about it. There's now some animal here flying around, okay? On the other hand, you have particle methods or moving mesh methods. The Lagrangian version, as you, as I told you, are sitting on the fluid, moving with the fluid, okay? If you have a grid-based, if you had a grid-based Lagrangian code, the, the grid itself would become distorted here. I hope you can still see my cursor. The connection is partly slower now, okay? And um, you are distorting the grid. But you can also have particles, particles resembling certain uh, properties of the fluid moving around and change the properties, for example. Then this equation, the same momentum equation you have on the left-hand side looks in this Lagrangian form like here. So you are having here the total time derivative here of the fluid, the acceleration is equal to the pressure here. And a well-known hydrodynamic method that in, is often used in astrophysics is the smooth particle hydrodynamics method here. I will can say something more about it later if there are some questions, but I did not intend. Unfortunately, I have to apologize, sorry for this. I thought there was not enough time to do this uh, in this introductory lecture here. So here you have, let's say, individual particles that move around, and you get a continuum approach if you take the average, let's say, value of the mass for, mass, for example, of each particle, calculate a density, and then you get some smooth property here. So each particle is not point-like, but has some sphere of influence, let's say, where it feels the impact of other particles there, okay? So in quotes, smeared out particles. Okay, and, and uh, the advantage, there are disadvantages and advantages on both sides. Yes, since you have this fixed grid here on the left-hand side um, in the Euler equations, uh, this can be a disadvantage when you have a very steep gradient like in this letters here. So it's very high density where the letter R is here and very low density here. And nevertheless, you have to cover everything which is empty here outside with the grid. While in the particle-based approach here, uh, if you have particles like down here, if you have particles here, the particles are only there where it's actually mass. Yeah? So you don't need to have a whole big grid covering the half of the universe. You have only their particles where there is a, a, a mass also. And, and that's why this method here, SPH, is used, for example, in cosmological simulations a lot, okay? Since there you have all the galaxies in otherwise empty space. So this is the ideal, let's say, mechanism to do for this. Okay. Um, Philly, yes. there is a question in the chat box. Probably you can see There's that. a question. You can, yeah, okay, I will. Thank you. Sorry for pointing this out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't look at this directly here. There's a question by Mahmoud. Okay. You have introduced hydro equations. Do these equations with the shape you present us can work for the methods that do not use? Yes, yeah, like SPH. Oh, yes, the, the um, hydro equations are essentially, of course, the equations that are used uh, in the SPH approach. It's, it's based smooth particle hydrodynamics. You also discretize directly the hydrodynamic equations, yes, and they, the solution of these also describe the hydrodynamics directly. It's just a different approach, yes. They solve the same physical problem, yes. So, if I understood correctly, so that means that in both methods there is discretization, but with different yes. methods. Yeah. Yes, yes. Clearly, I mean, here you discretize on a grid on the left-hand side with the Euler equation, and smooth particle hydrodynamics also discretizes on these particles. I mean, not everybody would agree with me. I don't know what Christoph says. Christoph is also online here. Um, what he says, some people say that this is essentially the particles are not particles, one should get, get away from this particle approach, but they are basically moving grid points, yes. So you have to consider it in this way. In that pay, pay way, the grid points are moving and you're solving the hydro equations not on a, let's say, regular rectangular grid, but rather on these grid points that move in space, okay.
that's a different approach. But the name ha contains the word particles and how these equations are, are, are formulated, it very much resembles the classic particle approach you know from, from Newtonian, um, like here from Newtonian physics. Yeah? So that's what the advantage is. So, but they both solve hydrodynamics, yes. As you can see, this is the, these equations are the same. Mathematically, they are the same. And you can solve them numerically in different ways, but the physical structure will be uh, uh, the same. Okay. Christoph writes in the chat that he agrees. Okay, Mahmoud, I hope your question is answered here. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's it's always very good that you ask the questions directly, uh, and then I can answer them. And if I don't see it immediately, then sorry. Thank you. Can point this out to me that somebody raised uh, their hand essentially. Good. Having that said, I will focus now, um, not on the SPH, unfortunately, but I have many slides stolen from Christoph. I can also make available if he agrees. We can talk about this later and then we can look at these slides directly. Okay. Um, I will focus now on the grid Euler-based representation here, since in, since in very, uh, a lot of modern codes this is used. I will point out the codes to you a little bit later. So here you can see the 1D Euler equations um, written down as a function of x and t now, where we just look at the x direction here. So we have mass conservation, momentum conservation, and we have energy conservation here. And what you have seen previously in 3D is now just written here in 1D and omitted here in the momentum equation 15, I omitted the gravity. There's this silly fly, sorry, there's this silly fly flying around my head here. So sometimes I am a little bit disturbed. Don't worry, okay? Um, in the equation of state. So this is just a repetition. By the way, gamma, if I haven't, didn't say it before, it's the so-called adiabatic exponent, which is the ratio of specific heats uh, Cp over Cv. Okay, but you have probably seen this before. Okay, it's a partial differential equation in space and time. This is important here. So if you discretize it, you have to do a discretization in space. You have to make a grid and you have to discretize in time. That means you have to step forward with certain time steps. I mean, if you have, let's say, some experience in ordinary differential equations there, there you, for example, in n-body simulations with stars and planets, you have the objects at certain times, and then you just uh, calculate the forces acting on them, and then you advance them in time, but there is no special grid needed for them. This is different in partial differential equations since they contain spatial derivatives and time derivatives at the same time, so you need a multidimensional grid and in 3D you would need a three-dimensional spatial grid so this is very cumbersome but uh, in principle the methods that I, uh, I lay out here to you are all the same whether you are in 1D, 2D and 3D because what people are doing in principle if they are, are working in multi-dimensions they solve always 1D problems along the coordinate lines respectively. Yes, you're solving for X, Y, and Z, one after the other. You do something what, like what people call directional splitting. So the methods that we explain here uh, in, in these uh, hydro equations for 1D, uh, it will also work in multi-dimensions if you consider the directions one after the other, okay? Good, and there was just a comment in the chat, not a question, I think, thanks. Okay, so this is the uh, 1D Euler equations that we are now trying to solve uh, with a certain scheme that I will uh, present to you. And then I would like to ask you in the project to do this for a simple linear advection problem. You can see here the nonlinearity, by the way, u times u directly. So you can see this here this equation clearly shows it best, the momentum equation, okay? Yes, there we go. So, you first do a spatial discretization on a grid where the x-coordinate you divide in certain grid cells here, which the, let's say, the uh, blue, light blue one here, or turquoise uh, color, I call it blue now, uh, 
grid point J, yes, and you have a function psi, I call it generically psi of x and t here on the y-axis here. The function, let's, let's say, has these properties as given by the solid line here, and you want to discretize it in the x direction on a grid. So that means you have certain grid points, j, j minus 1, j, and j plus 1 here, for example. I plotted three grid points, and you have the values here, psi j plus 1, psi j here, and then you have here psi j minus 1. This the, the cross here should be in the middle of this here somehow, but it's slightly shifted here. Okay. Um, so we have this function psi x of t. You discretize it here on a, on a grid uh, with a, a constant, let's say, grid size. So the difference between xj plus 1 minus xj is just delta x here. And this is just given here if you have n grid points here by the uh, difference of the maximum minus the minimum x here divided by the grid points gives you the grid size delta x, okay? And you can consider then, we denote, let's say, the value of psi x and t at grid point j and times tn as psi n j, okay? This is the value of psi, as I wrote here, as grid point xj and time tn. So the upper index refers to the time level, the lower index refers to the spatial uh, location where we are at. So we can write now here for psi jn, we can write, which is given is this one here by definition, okay, which is given numerically by the mean of the function here, psi of x, at n times delta t, assuming that the time, let's say, uh, uh, step delta t is always constant in time. So we're doing n time steps, each have the same length delta t. So we have this value here, and then we integrate it over delta x, and then we have this quantity, the numerical quantity here is given approximately by the integral over the function on at one grid point, okay? And then we have to divide by the volume here. So we can directly translate this 1D property into a 3D property by doing these integrals that I show you here over 3D space instead of 1D space, okay? So we can see here that in this simple representation I've shown you in this figure here, in each grid cell, the function is represented by a constant value here. So this psi is a piecewise constant function, okay? So it's a step function, essentially, yes? Where in each, let's say, box here, let's say, if this is the mass, if this is the density, sorry, if this is the density, the psi, psi equals rho, for example, then the integral over this box here would just be the mass contained in the whole box, okay? So it has a physical meaning also, by the way. So this is the average density here in this, um, in this grid cell. Okay. And we have to integrate over the uh, interval here, which goes from minus, yes, yeah, so you go minus half a grid size here and go to plus half a grid size here. And that's why you have this strange looking upper and lower boundary in this integral here. But this comes just about because of the notation of the grid. And here I used integer numbers for the grid on the, in this grid centers. So it's a grid center uh, 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 notation here, okay? So this is how we start, spatial discretization, okay? Constant grid cells, delta x, and we'll have constant time steps, delta t, and this simple example that I will discuss today. Okay, so the, the problem is now to discretize our numerical equations in space and time. So we have the general equations for all variables here. We have here the time derivative here. Yes, let's say psi would be, for example, density, momentum density, and energy density. And then we have an operator here, which takes these psi's here. Psi can be a vector in this case, if you have more functions, which takes this vector psi here at certain time here. So this is the general structure of the Heidel equations. You can write them formally like this, okay? Think that psi is a vector here. 
but we are just taking one simple test equation as an example here. And so we have a spatial differential operator. So all the time derivatives on the left. And we, you know, or you can see already now that the simple hydro equations have only first order time derivatives on the left and first order and also higher order possibly time, uh, spatial derivatives. So if you have a diffusion part or something or take viscosity in the momentum equations, you would have second order time derivatives here on the right while you're having always first order time derivatives. So, so this is a type, uh, mathematically, these are equations that are either hyperbolic, yeah? if you have only first order spatial time, uh, spatial derivatives on the right, then they are hyperbolic. If you have also second order spatial derivatives on the right, they would change their character to parabolic. So the, these are the mathematical structures here. Hyperbolic type gives rise to waves, and then you have the parabolic type, diffusion properties gives rise to diffusion, as I said. Okay, so I'll consider now the first order spatial derivatives here. So here, how to discretize the left side first here, which is done very simply here. I'm coming here from, by the way, from the so-called finite difference approach that I'm using here. So this time derivative is very simply written just by a first order Taylor expansion here. Yes, at time t, we are at time level tn, we have done n time steps already and want to go for time from time step n to time step n plus one. So we are stepping forward, let's say one time step delta t. So here we have t plus delta t minus psi of t divided by delta t, which is just this uh, time derivative, first order discretized. And then we write it like this, because this one here, T n plus T plus delta T is just T n plus one, as you can see from this here. You just add one delta T here. Then we have psi n plus one minus psi n divided by delta T is just the operator given as function of psi n. Okay. So on the right hand side, we we plug in the known values of the variables that we have, and on the left hand side, we step forward one. Uh, time step more, and then we can rewrite the equation here, and we have the psi n plus one is equal to psi n plus delta t times an operator L, which I denoted, so I went from curly L in this general mathematical expression to regular capital L here, because capital L is now the discretized differential operator curly L, okay? And you can see here in general that this discretization operator that we are going to develop is a function of course on our discretized variables here psi and k and k means here k is a set of different uh, uh, of the function at different grid points so it's as i said it's a set of spatial indices so k can for example can be j minus 2 up to j plus 2 uh, for a second order scheme and this is called the stencil Okay, so the, so the uh, keyword stencil describes how you are discretizing the right-hand side and how many grid points you need, spatial grid points, that is, you need to evaluate the right-hand side. And you know, maybe if you have done some numerical analysis already, the more grid points you take to evaluate a derivative, the higher the order of this um, derivative is. This is in principle so. So from, 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 let's say, if you have a smoothed flows, you would say, yes, the higher I take the order of the spatial derivative, the, the higher the order of accuracy of my evolution will be. This is in principle true, uh, but in hydrodynamics, there will, discontinuities will develop shock fronts. And if you take a higher, very high order scheme at shock fronts, you are having problems. And so, uh, in, in hydrodynamics, you are changing consistently between high order schemes and smooth flows and lower order or even first order schemes in at discontinuity regions here. And that's one important aspect of fluid dynamics. Okay, so this is the time derivative will always be written uh, in this lecture here as the first order time derivative. I will say something about other time derivatives here. You can imagine you have some sort of Runge-Kutta 
scheme doing different orders here. This is also done in modern uh, hydro codes. They do second order runge cutter or second or third order runge cutter schemes also, where the, this time derivative is just replaced by high order uh, uh, a a high order time derivative. But in that case, you may need to store several time levels of your variables. This is clear, as you know, also from maybe from an American analysis of ordinary differential equations. The higher order you take here, the more values you need in the time, in the, in the, in the past times. And that's what you may not have available. OK. Now, on the right-hand side now, so we have seen spatial derivative of some vector quantity A here, generic name, is given by different operators here. For example, you have here the pressure term in the um, in the momentum equation plus the force term, for example, here. Or here I wrote L1 would be always the advection term, okay, which you always have in all hydro equations, and L2 would be pressure or external forces. You can imagine you have more terms here, L3, L4, which would describe something like viscosity, for example, even MHD, there was a comment on, on magneto hydrodynamics, would be additional terms here. Or let's say diffusion, you could add more operators on the right hand side. And one important thing that you need to do in certain cases is you need to solve these one after the other. I mean, Riemann solvers, for example, take these two L1 and L2 advection and pressure terms both together and in one term and can solve them together to maintain the wave properties. But if you have viscosity as a third part or diffusion, radiative transport and other, uh, as other parts, they are always separated off and solved in a subset. And this is called operator splitting. You're splitting the operators on the right hand side into different parts and solve one after the other. And this is described here. Okay, here we, we know the variables at time level a n here in equation 22, a n on the right hand side. We want to step first by applying the operator L1 from the first part, from the advection part here, and obtain an intermediate value a1 here. This is intermediate. It's not yet at the full n plus 1 time step level because you haven't solved the second part. The second part then calculates a2 here by applying the second operator, L2 here, on the variables that you have calculated in the first step. So you do a step-by-step -step procedure. So each time step is splitted into n different steps if you have n operators on the right-hand side, okay? And so we have your different spatial operators here, L1 and L2, corresponding to these original operators curly L1, curly L2 here in equation 21, okay? That's called operator splitting, and this simplifies matter considerably, yes, because you are stepping forward in time successively. First advection, then forces, then viscosity, then diffusion, and so on. So you can work numerical schemes for each part individually, one after the other. And this is, of course, a great simplification. They can all be written in modules, different modules, and you use one module after the other here. Okay. Good. Do I still have time? Yes, I think I will just go on here. 